many, many clients, almost all of them are asking me to combine components of all of these to talk about leadership qualities, like leading by example, appreciating your colleagues, communicating mindfully. And they also wanted me to talk about workplace culture, how leaders set the tone for the culture of any organization. If the culture of the organization is gonna thrive, it has to be demonstrated by the leadership, right? But what I'm finding is it's sort of like a hybrid model where people are asking me to combine components of these to create a very holistic, complete talk where people are motivated to be better leaders, to be better colleagues. And at the same time, they're inspired in their own self-care and to be compassionate and caring for their colleagues as well. Because that's the only way an organization thrives is if we remain connected. Welcome to Engage Presents. I'm Engage co-founder and president Jay Golson. In this interview series, I ask engaged talent the most common questions we hear from event planners to help you get to know them and their stories in 15 minutes or less. Thanks for listening. Welcome to another episode of Engage Presents. I am Jake Olson, and joining me today is Punit Dasa. He is a workplace culture and mindfulness expert and a former monk. Very interesting, Punit. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. And I won't steal your thunder. I want you to kind of explain um, who you are and kind of what takeaways does an audience uh, come away with after hearing you speak. Thank you for having me, Jake. And, you know, as you mentioned, I'm a former monk. And that's the number one question I get asked is, why did you become a monk and why are you no longer a monk? <laughs> so I can start with that. Um, <laughs> you know, it's going, becoming a monk is probably a little bit different for everyone. I went through lots of ups and, ups and downs. My parents moved to the U.S. from India having nothing. We became multimillionaires, mm -hmm. enjoyed the good life for a while, then went completely bankrupt, then ended up going to post-communist Bulgaria in the early 1990s. Spent a couple of years there. That was quite an adventure. Moved to the East Coast. Then I decided to, that I needed a break from life. I went to India to check out living uh, in a monastery, what that was like. Thought I'd be there for a month. Spent six months there. Came back, moved into a monastery in New York. Spent 15 years living as a monk in New York. And then I left the monastery to speak in corporations on these topics of workplace culture, mindful leadership, and workplace wellness. That is that is fascinating. What what so what what is it just quickly kind of what what is it like living in a monastery? Well, I think it's probably a little different for everyone. You're living very closely with a lot of people. And really, it's the life of humility, service and self-reflection, service to others, you know, being humble about the gifts that you've been giving and really just making sure you're understanding your purpose in life. And I can say it was an amazing experience that I love sharing that's, that's one of the first stories I share when I give any talk is share very quickly how I became a monk and why I'm not a monk and one or two takeaways that I took from that. Amazing. Is, is society on the outside, like once you, once you re-enter society as a whole, is it just, I mean, I don't, I don't want to use the word like disgusting, but is it just like abhorrent of just like, oh my gosh, people are just uh, animals. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, how am I different from anyone else, except that I spent some time in a monastery, and I know that we all need help. And we, we can we're all looking to progress in some way or another, some financially, some personally, individually, and some both. And so my goal as being a monk and after the mon monastic life is to help people reach that transformation. And so, you know, so when I speak about workplace culture, one of the things that in addition to my telling my story, I talk about is that's really important that all of us are leading by example, especially if you're in a leadership role, you can't mm -hmm. say one thing and then do something else. It really breaks trust. And right. even if you're not in a leadership role, we can all have that leadership mindset and, and really lead by example for our colleagues because we, can, we have the power to motivate and inspire and encourage our colleagues. So leading by examples is a message that I so strongly believe. And I, I talk about in my in all of my talks, whether it's virtual or in person, and I think another really important component of some one of the takeaways that I provide is emphasizing that organizations need to implement systems where people can take care of themselves, that self-care, the mm. idea that self-care is not selfish and that people aren't embarrassed to talk about and take care of their mental health. Because if we're not taking care of ourselves and our mental health is just sort of falling apart, how productive can we be, first of all? And how, what kind of relationships can we have with our colleagues and clients? You can't have any kind of relationship if you're falling apart on the inside. So 
And if we're spending more than half of our waking time in the workplace, it's really important that the workplace provides, encourages, and supports their work, their employees in maintaining their physical, emotional, and mental well-being. I think it becomes a part of the responsibility of the organization to provide all of that. Yeah. And, and you know, and one of the things that practical tools that I provide so help people take care of themselves is I I share some of the science on mindfulness and guide every audience of the hundreds of speeches I've given. I've always had the audience close their eyes at the end of my talk and guide them through about a five minute breathing and focusing techniques mm. so that they understand how these practices can help them with their own self-care and mental health and how they can be utilized during the workday, like before a meeting that you think may be a little crazy or after a difficult meeting, you take time out, you take a, a breather to reset your mind, to sort of close the apps in your mind, to, to disconnect before you run off to your next project or task. So, you know, in addition to my story, these are some of the key messages that I like to share with my audiences. Very cool. Very cool. So what would you, you know, what would you want an event planner to know what it's like to work with you, you know, from a pre pre call standpoint or pre, um, you know, experience standpoint, again, you kind of mentioned on stage of what you're delivering and, and, and even bringing in that, um, that little, uh, you know, breathing exercise you were just talking about. That's really cool. But what, what would you kind of want someone to know what it's like to, to work with a punnet? Well, I know that the meeting uh, planning profession is one of the, if not the most stressful professions out there. So that's something I've learned by working with a lot of meeting planners. So one thing I want to be able to do is reduce their stress by being timely in my responsiveness when they want a bio, a headshot, a description mm -hmm. of my speeches, or just whatever that they need. I want to make their lives easier. So I want to make sure that I can get that to them as quickly as possible and be as responsive to their needs as possible to keep things moving on their end and on my end and everything and on the event. And uh, then, of course, you know, on stage, I feel that I can want I share my story that really grabs the audience's attention because most of the time, you know, a lot of people have heard from professional athletes or somebody who climbed Mount Everest that most people haven't heard from what it was like to live as a monk. <laughs> so I kind of have a, a bit of a unique story uh, that uh, will engage the audience throughout my talk. I'm asking audience different questions uh, that keeps them thinking, keeps, I ask them to raise their hand and answer questions. So this way I keep the audience engaged. And of course, towards the end that the whole mindfulness practice, from my experience, when I've uh, at a conference, that after the, the, the mindfulness techniques, I have people approaching me. It becomes the talk of the conference, actually, because most conferences are go, 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 go. One talk, one talk, another talk, another talk, right? Lunch, another talk, another talk. So there's no chance for people to take a break and decompress and just prepare themselves. And as soon as they do that, they're just so grateful that they had a chance at a very busy event, at a very busy meeting to close their eyes and relax a little so they they can be ready for the next several sessions that they're going to attend so basically on stage they're going to get a very very engaging talk and an experience that the audience will remember for a very long time one last question Punnett. um you know you you, you kind of have listed at least on our site you know three different speeches it seems like you you know can really customize um, you, you know, your talk to, you know, again, if it is a workplace culture or if it is a group of individuals at a conference, uh, talk about mindset, but just kind of go go through just a little process of what it's like to, for you to customize, um, you know, a talk to, to best um, deliver to the audience you're speaking to. Yeah, customization has become the name of the game, especially for me post COVID, right? So what's happening right now is the topics that I speak on are mindful leadership, and that's usually geared for a room full of leaders. Right. Uh, and then workplace culture, it's for folks that are in leadership and not in leadership, and then mental health and well-being. So all of these topics, clients are asking me to combine components of each of these talks because they're all intertwined. You can't ignore mental health and, ex and well-being and expect to have good workplace culture. And you can't expect leaders to be ignoring these things and expect to be present, focused, and thoughtful leaders. You, you just can't. So. Right. What's, being, what's happening right now is the topic of mindful leadership, workplace culture, and well-being 
many, many clients, almost all of them are asking me to combine components of all of these. So talk about leadership qualities, like leading by example, appreciating your colleagues, co communicating mindfully. And they also wanted me to talk about workplace culture, how leaders set the tone for the culture of any organization. If the culture of the organization is going to thrive, it has to be demonstrated by the leadership, right? So this is sort of what's happening, whether it's virtual, whether it's in person. There, Obviously, I can just speak on leadership and workplace culture. But what I'm finding is it's sort of like a hybrid model where people are asking me to combine components of these to create a very holistic, complete talk where people are motivated to be better leaders, to be better colleagues. And at the same time, they're inspired in their own self-care and to be compassionate and caring for their colleagues as well. Because that's the only way an organization thrives is if we remain connected. And, you know, there's one example I like is of the California redwood trees. They're some of the tallest trees on the planet, like two, 300 feet tall, 10, 20 feet wide, but they have a very shallow root system. And how do they remain standing throughout all the storms in the hundreds of years is they're connected at the roots. Their roots reach out to other roots and they stay mm. supported and they stay and they, they all survive. That's what an organization needs to be, where colleagues can re feel comfortable reaching out to others where they don't feel it's a sign of weakness to reach out to others for help. They feel supported, connected with each other. And then an entire forest of trees is supported where an entire organization is supported, where you know that you, somebody's got your back instead of having to look over your shoulder on a regular basis. Well, as a Californian myself, that, I, I never knew that. And that, that is fascinating. Much in, great insight from you, Punit, uh, Punit Dasa. Go ahead. Let'sEngage.com. You can view his profile. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Punnett, and giving us your insight. And um, again, seems like what you're talking about is, is is much needed in today's world. Yeah, thank you so much, Jake. I really appreciate you having me here. Yeah, look forward to you know working with you guys a lot more. Awesome, Punnett Dasa, everybody. Stay tuned for Engage Presents as we bring on more talent. And with that, we'll sign off. Thank you. <laughs>